Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 93, we're going to talk about upgrading an existing amp. And I've got Charles here to give us a hand. I'm right here. Okay, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. So a long time ago, I built a nice pair of monoblocks for my home system. Now a monoblock is just a one, it's just one channel of ampli amplification. It doesn't have a preamp. It's dead easy, dead simple. Now because I was still learning how to do amplifier design, I built it to someone else's published schematic. Now move forward to last month when I happened to mention them to an audio enthusiast who already had our universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp. In fact, his unit is the original prototype. So I thought the monoblocks might be a good fit. And he agreed. So before I handed them over, I thought, let's put them on the bench and check them out, put them on the scope. And that's when I realized that maybe some modifications were needed before I hand them over. So let's just take a quick look at them. They're about as simple as you can get. There's a power transformer, an output transformer, a large filter cap, a driver tube. Originally a driver tube was a 6SN7 with two stages of gain and the power, power stage was always a 6L6. This is the Soviet equivalent of a 6L6. Let's flip it over and have a look inside. So. Here we've got our power supply board. I just rebuilt on our, our standard kit boards. So I took out the, the prototype board. I've, everything has been thrown away, so unfortunately I can't show you what was here. Over here we had the 6SN7. We had two stages of gain. And this was a real snarl. There was feedback going on. Um, the, the amp was set up to run in ultralinear mode. And I just wasn't happy with the performance of the 6SN7 stage. But I happened to have in my back pocket the design work we did for the URI. And this is a very similar amp to the URI. Uses a very similar output tube. It uses the Soviet 6P7S. But that is essentially a 6L6 with a top cap, right? So the power tube was basically the same. And I thought, why don't I put the driver stage of the URI into this amp. And whenever you have um, an existing amplifier, particularly a vintage amplifier, let's say it's using a tube that's not commonly available anymore, or you're really not happy with how the performance of that first stage is, you can drop an entire new stage in there. Take out the old one and put in a new one, and hopefully things improve. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Let me grab the schematic. So this is the URI, and the URI is about as simple as it gets. It's got one voltage gain stage at the CV6. So we take the signal in, we amplify the voltage, we go through a coupling capacitor, and we go into the power tube, and Bob's your uncle, you got sound, right? Now, originally I had two stages of gain, so imagine this circuit doubled, and of course the 6SN7 is a twin triode. So it's two tubes in one envelope, so you only need one 6SN7. The CV6 type is a single triode, and in pure class A, that's all you need. You can get enough voltage out of a CV6 to drive a 6P7S or a 6L6 in, to maximum power in pure class A. So let's look at what I ended up doing. So I dropped in the URI driver circuit here in its entirety and I took out the old circuit. I upgraded the coupling capacitor and I rebiased the power tube. And at that point I sat down and I had a listen. And I thought they sounded great. But I knew I needed help. It's always good to have a second set of experienced listening ears. And that's where um, Charles came in. 
Yep, so I came over and I had a good listen to them and immediately to me they sounded a little bit muddy. Uh, they, uh, the bass wasn't as well defined, the music wasn't quite popping with them. So I recommended that we remove the ultra-linear tap. Right, and bring them over into pure class A quasi-triode mode. And I think, I'll show you, I'll actually show you what we had to do. So here's the 40% tap here. Where's that schematic? Hang on. So for a 40% tap comes off of the primary side of the output transformer. It's just a tap, and it's at 40% of the turn ratio and it comes in here and it connects up to the screen grid which is grid, grid 2 and so I had to take this off of the G2 connection and I put in a 100 ohm resistor that connects up the high voltage to the plate ties it to grid 2 and at that point we're now in what's called triode mode and that's all it, it is. I think it took me all of, what, a half an hour and I did both amps? Something like that. And then we had another listen and... Wow, yeah. Is, what a difference with it. In the first 30 seconds we could hear that the music was popping, the bass had recovered, and that the music just seemed to be coming out of a black, blank background. Yeah, I mean that was the one thing I couldn't hear in ultralinear mode. I, I honestly didn't hear that veiled sound until until you pointed it out and then it's like huh i need to do some more work on this amplifier but i think we're both huge fans of of pure class a uh quasi triode or triode mode it's just it's it's to me it's the only way to go the only downside to that as far as i can tell is you need efficient speakers because right. you're limited to a big triode will get up, let's say a 300B, will get you up to about 8 watts. There are some bigger triodes that will be higher powered, but at that point you have what I call a winter amp only because <laughs> they're so big and they're so damn hot. Um, but in general, the, the more regular sized power tubes will put out what about um, somewhere in the two to four watt range, probably. Yeah. yeah, and this this I think I I measured this at two point two watts in its current configuration. Two point two. Yeah, and I think the Yuri is two point two five. So I mean that's ba it's ba this I basically turned this design into very much into a Yuri, which we we love. Yep, so, and it sounds great, just like the Yuri does. The new owner is coming over tomorrow, and I've put aside some time for a critical listening session. Hopefully, hopefully I say, he likes it as much as we do. God knows I put a lot more work into it than I thought I was going to have to. But anyways, that's that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Okay, well, uh, Charles, you have been busy over at Melatone Kits, and I know that you've actually started building the first headphone amplifier prototype. I you? have. So uh, I've started building the first prototype. It's being built on essentially our standard chassis design. However, the end design that we'd like to have is something that's quite a bit more like this. So we want to go vertical. And the idea behind this is that we want to save desk space for people that are using these amplifiers, uh, say next to their home computer or to be able to sit them on a small side table or next to your listening chair. And so we wanted to get a really nice classy design and this was the first mock-up and uh, tell me what you told me whenever you saw it. Well, as soon as you said go vertical, I that's what popped into my head was this design. You hadn't shown me a drawing yet. No, not yet. <laughs> um, now, we've already had one uh, manufacturing designing meeting right in which we spent oh we must have been at it for an hour talking about how we could take what I think is a beautiful rendition a piece of sculpture really and turn this actually physically make this right yeah yeah so we need to figure out how we can manufacture this for a reasonable price and how we can make it easy for kit builders to put this together so that is what we're working on right now and simultaneously I am working on the first prototype which is already constructed and in the initial stages of testing. And we'll put uh, we'll put a segment into one of the Friday TubeLab videos on your progress. 
But I think we're going to start putting more content over in Melatone Kits channel, right? That's right. So on Melatone Kits, you're going to start seeing new videos pop up where you see me work on the design of the schematic, the PCB boards, and the actual physical construction of this amplifier. Well, the prototype. Anyway. Well, of the prototype, yeah. yeah. So stay tuned for that. Okay, excellent. Okay, and you know, we were talking about the... Um, we're talking about the the rebuilding of the monoblock and of course I completely forgot to make the point that I was building up to which is if you've got an existing amplifier let's say with a driver stage that's just not working for you maybe it's got a tube that's no longer commonly available or what's been happening lately it's the tube has become I mean, so expensive. Incredibly expensive or hard to find, yeah. Or hard to find. There's no sin in taking the driver stage of an existing amplifier or the preamplifier stage, whatever it is, and just pulling that whole circuit out and putting in a known good circuit. Now, we publish all of our schematics under the download section on our website. Mm -hmm. And they are open source, so anybody can use them for non-commercial use. And, you know, you use them at your own risk, of course. And I'm, we just put up, talking about um, schematics, we've just put up what will be the pr production version of the URI. Uh, it's become a 2.2 watt RMS amp from a 2 watt. It's now version 7.2. So this, the full set of schematics are up. And I've already spent, oh, a couple of months trialing them. We still have to actually... Um, put them through the, the bench testing and get the numbers published. Yeah, and update the specification sheet for it. But and, as you can see, we've been able to get a little bit more power out of it, and we just love the sound. And it, I cleaned up the signal a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so I got that out. <laughs> okay, now what came in this week? Well, oh, one second there. Before we get to oh. that, we need your help with something. So, if we're building a headphone amplifier, we need headphones to test it with. We've got a nice pair of Sennheisers right here. This is one of the older models, the uh, 59, oh, 598SE. But this isn't representative of everything that's out there on the market. So we need your help with some good reference headphones. Uh, we need your recommendations for them. Something that isn't too expensive and is readily available and that you'd like to have us test the headphone amplifier with. So if you can leave your suggestions in the comments or send us a message, that would be great. Yeah, and I think we're prepared to spend some money, right? Of course, yeah. We want to make sure it's going to sound good on modern, high-quality headphones. Quality yeah. is a must. And I think the big thing we're stuck with is a lot of headphones, even expensive ones, don't have a flat EQ, do they? No. No. So we really that's going to be one of the key decisions... Um, we need headphones that sound good, that people want to actually use in their system, but the response has to, I mean, headphones are notorious for not being flat. We don't want them coloring the sound if we can avoid it. That's right. So if you choose to use a set of headphones that have some bass boost and some treble boost, well, that's the sound you like and that's fine, but we need to, the, the actual amplifier needs to produce a flat signal. Yeah. And we need uh, proper headphones to test that with. Great. All right, so let's get these out of the way here. Yeah, a whole bunch of stuff came in. So let me get it all lined up. Okay. Oh, let's get these both out. So let's start off with these Svetlanas from 1956. Uh, 856, so um, August 1956. These are the 6P6C in Cyrillic, which translates to the 6, uh, sorry, 6Pi 6C. That translates to the 6P6S. <laughs> God. Um, it's a real tongue twister. I know, and I'm, I'm amazed that I can actually remember all these translations. Basically, this is an early 6V6GT. That's it's an equivalent to that tube. It's got a lovely black coating. If you follow this channel for any length of time, you know I love the sound of Svetlana's. So a bunch of these will be in the store hopefully on the weekend. Charles is testing them up. 
Here is another Svetlana tube, all from the 1970s. We've got a whole bunch of them in. And this, I'm not going to go over the numbers with you. This is basically the Soviet equivalent of the 6AS7G. So this is the first version, the ST or shoulder tube. Everybody calls these Coke bottles. So there's nothing wrong with sending me a note and saying, Jim, those Svetlana Coke bottles <laughs> for, the, for my uh, headphone amplifier. They sound great. Well, that's what everybody is saying about the Svetlanas. Everybody loves the sound of these. But, you know, it's not surprising to me. I don't have currently a headphone amplifier that uses these as uh, an OTL, a, an a output transformerless um, mm -hmm. amplifier. But um, I know Svetlana tubes. And honestly, you know, everybody knows about Mullard and uh, RCA and Philips and Telefunken as being great, Siemens, as being great manufacturers of tubes. Nobody seems to talk about Svetlana that was based in St. Petersburg and had a huge uh, number of years of production as being a great tube manufacturer. But honestly, I think they're up there with the best. They, their tubes are that good. Okay, a whole bunch of them will hopefully be in the store this weekend. And... A bunch of my one of my favorite EL34s came in RFTs. Now RFTs are fairly easy to identify. Other than the very early production years, they've got a little bump where the pins go in, a little circular plastic bump, and that lets you know you've got an RFT. Interestingly enough, they all have a dimple, but they have the dimples vary, so one year to another. So the production line for the glass wasn't, you know, 100% uniform, but you know, a dimple is a dimple. It's not going to affect the sound in any way. Anyways, enough of these came in that there's some nice quads in the store and, you know, keeping EL34s in stock is, it's almost a full-time job because there's such high demand for EL34s. Okay, as always, I saved the best for last. This is a real box. There are fake boxes out there, so beware. If the box you're seeing on a listing looks too good to be true, guess what? It is. This is one of my favorite all-time tubes. This is the 12-volt version of the 6SN7 GT Bad Boy. Let me open them up carefully here. Hang on. We've only got one match pair in the store. Uh, we do have a whole bunch of Jan tubes. So the mil spec version of this. Oh, I'm messing up the box already. Hang on. These boxes, you know, they're 60, 70 years old. Oh, so so delicate. Yeah, I know. I know. So I should be more careful. <laughs> so sometimes new old stock tubes, you know, they look sort of new old stock. Look at these. They are absolutely brand new. They were a little dusty in the box, and that was about it. If you want to know if you really have a new old stock tube, there's three things to look at. Three. Look at the pins. Are they pristine? They can be a little dull because, you know, after 60 or 70 years of oxidizing in the air, and they can be, br you can brush these up and they'll clean up so they're nice and bright again. But the, look for them for wear. And these are perfect. Look at the chrome gathering. How intact is that? This is absolutely full. There's no line of, of receding. You'll see a little white, white line when it's receding if it's been in use or if the vacuum has been slightly challenged over the years. And it's absolutely perfect. And then look at your base and your label. Notice how the label actually looks really old. It, the print just faded. But the plastic is in very good shape. And because we've got the original boxes, we know for sure now that we've got the real McCoy. Anyways, uh, a pair of these are in the store. And um, you can tell Charles is a little neater than I am. He's doing, he's doing almost all the testing now. Okay. Well, if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping at $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. 
Have fun. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.